Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors, Lawmatics, Noda, and Lawya. Welcome to Guy and Conrad and our special guest, Ruki, at Tech Show. Guy, it is great to see you. Great to see you. I do appreciate that you're wearing a t-shirt while I'm wearing a button-up. This is the first time that you are more well-dressed than me. But you still look better than I do. Well, I don't know about that. We all know that. Look at the hair. Thank (laughs) you. Guy, we are not doing any news today. We are going straight to two segments with Allison, no longer Allison Shields. Congratulations on the marriage. And Rookie Tajani. So we've got two great guests. We usually don't do guests, but we thought we'd take a chance at Tech Show. Well, we don't do guests. We're doing friends. We're doing friends. Oh, my gosh. Even Thank better. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't Game I feel privileged? Mm-hmm. And by the way, I have to say, I know you had a lot to do this, and you'll humbly deflect all of the plaudits. Absolutely. Tech Show, fantastic this Amazing. Year. Oh, Gee. you're too kind. Well, like I said, uh, I'm just very uh, fortunate and grateful for the amazing people on the Tech Show planning board because they're making me look good. See, I know. He's, he's, he's being a good leader and, he's being, mm, yes. and putting the plaudits down very to his true, but it's all true. But, it's all true. Uh, you can yeah. also say I did that stuff. It's also, I, did some, I did a couple <laughs> things. I, I did a few things. <laughs> all right. Let's hear the music. And when we come back, Allison Joe's at Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Nicely done. Welcome to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing, teaching you how to promote, market, and make fat stacks for your legal practice here on Legal Talk Network. Allison, thanks so much for sitting down to talk with me today. As you know, we just did a session together. And what I'm really curious about is, what is the ABA's tech survey? Because that's what we talked about. Yeah, absolutely. So the ABA does a legal technology survey every year that they send out to practitioners of firms of all sizes. And they ask questions. The survey is a, a number of different volumes on different topics. And... In response to the survey, then they compile the data that they receive, and there's a survey report that goes out. And then the Legal Technology Resource Center also does a number of tech reports talking about what what lawyers are using, what they're not using, and, and what the tech report author thinks maybe that lawyers should do differently or or what the future looks like for the use of legal technology. Awesome. Thank you for that. And you know, one of the things that and don't quote me on the numbers I didn't memorize them but I recall <laughs> as in our from our presentation a couple of ones that really stood out to me number one was about only half of law firms that were of size two to nine or solos even had a marketing budget at all or budget at all a budget period isn't that wasn't that what it was yeah yeah I, I think the two to nine was even less than that I think it was about 40 percent of the smaller firms overall, and then the, the really small firms from two to nine was only, if I'm not mistaken, more like 12%. And on this year's survey, the 0% of the solos had, had a budget, which is like, I, I think, and I think we talked about it a little bit this morning, more than anybody a solo needs to have a budget because they really need to know where their money's going and what money they have and <laughs> what to do with it. You know, and I think we talked not just about budgeting money, but, but allocating time, which I is really important, again, especially for, I mean, for all lawyers, because we all don't have enough time in the day, but for solos who are wearing many hats, if they're not carving out that time to do the marketing, it's it's not getting done, and then the business isn't going to come in, right? That's right. And, that, and that's the thing that I, that I loved about the conversation that we had as well. Lawyers, like, they're chasing these shiny objects, you know, TikTok's out, like, oh, I need, you know, it used to be I need to be on Vine, and we talk, we kind of laughed about Pokemon Go, but <laughs> the, the truth is, is that marketing is so inextricably intertwined with productivity, because, especially if you're a solo, because if you're doing it yourself, the, all the activity is coming from you, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, and you've got to figure out how you're going to make that happen, um, and I think one of the interesting questions that we got this morning, you know, we were talking about websites was, well, as a solo, I'm afraid if I have a website that I might get too many leads and then I can't handle the work, right? Which, of course, you and I kind of chuckle at, like, what better problem to have than I I have too much work? You know, and so one of the things that I like to tell clients when they give me that as an excuse for I don't have a website 
is now you have an opportunity if you have more leads than you can handle to do a couple of different things. One is refer to other lawyers and build that network and build those relationships. Another is maybe outsourcing in a different way so you keep the work. But if you refer, maybe you can make some money off of that referral and not do any more work. But you can also maybe raise your prices and take a different level of client and you can still do the same amount of work and be making more money. Yeah, so. I'd, I'd rather solve the uh, service delivery problem than the uh, client generation problem. You know, another stat that jumped out at me was I think it was like 80% of lawyers don't have live chat on their website. And, you know, look, chat, it's one way that potential clients can engage, but that really became a conversation about intake and the ways that you do intake in general. What types of things do you see out there in terms of you know, both from the survey respondents with that, you know, 80% alarming kind of stat, no one has live chat. What are some ways you're seeing lawyers actually improving their intake process? Yeah, so, and I, it's about giving people options, right? So some people would rather have the automated option and other people really want to talk to a person. So to give them the option. So if you, if you have live chat on your site, maybe there are basic things that that can be answered and, and maybe that helps with then the subsequent conversation, right? At some, maybe you drive people from that chat bot or that live chat, maybe then you drive them to Calendly for an initial consult, but they've got the information, the lawyer has the information from the chat bot, so they don't have to ask those basic questions up front. I think that idea of giving people the option to schedule some kind of a, an appointment or a consultation right from your your website is is also a great option. And there are lots of processes that you can streamline in the intake process so that the lawyer can focus on what the lawyer does best, which is the relationship part with the client. Totally. And we would be remiss if we didn't bring it up because everybody's talking about it. What role, if any, do you think chat GPT plays or is likely to play in how lawyers are doing business development? I think we, we you should have done some kind of a tech show contest or something around how many times chat GPT is, is mentioned totally. at, the, at the show it's the, this it's year. It's the hotness. It's the, shi- <laughs> it's it's the shiniest the- of all objects. <laughs> so, you know, there certainly is a role. I think that role is more for helping to generate ideas, but also to help you curate content. So, you know, I'm always telling my clients, you don't always have to be coming up with your own content. You can just curate content and be the clearinghouse for you know, what, what's the kind of information that your clients or your referral sources are looking for? And you become the go-to person for them, and they just go to you, even if you didn't write the article or, or originate the content. So chat GPT can be great for that too. You say, find me a series of articles on this topic. And then all you have to do is jump to the article and make sure that it's really relevant. You know, you always have to make sure that you're, you're checking, whether you're outsourcing to technology, to AI, or to another person, you have to mention with lawyers, right? You're responsible for the content that goes up on your website or on your social media profile. So so you've got to vet that and make sure that it's accurate, that it's up to date. But I think chat GPT and the other iterations and other AI tools that are going to be coming out probably fast and furious. I mean, next year, chat GPT will be like old hat and there'll be 10 other new It'll things. It'll be chat GPT 7 already. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but it doesn't take the place of the conversation. So if we're talking about digital marketing and social media, it doesn't take the place of that that human connection. Well, uh, at the risk of just making more echoes in the echo chamber, I completely agree with you. But you did hit one more, th- you hit something there that reminded me of one more thing. And that was, the survey said something, I might get this wrong again, but did zero respondents say they're creating video content for solos? Was that part of it? It seemed very low. It was a very low number, okay. and I haven't memorized the numbers either, but that's one thing I've been been—I've been talking about that for the, the past couple of years in, in my tech report on the websites and marketing, that I, there's huge opportunity in video, and that's a great way to establish your authenticity. And look, for a lot of lawyers who are in solo and small firms, they, they've got consumer-facing practices. So you've got a person who's panicking about a legal problem, who wants to find a lawyer that is going to, that they know is going to obviously be knowledgeable, be understanding, someone that they're comfortable talking to, some someone that they're comfortable telling <laughs> the bad things, right, that got them into maybe a legal problem to begin with. And so doing those videos 
shows them who you are. It shows them what kind of person you are. It shows them how you speak, which is a big deal. You know, I, I can speak in layman's terms to you about this legal problem that you have. So it's really a good way to sort of introduce yourself to potential clients or to referral sources or to, just to people who have questions and to build up your network. And it surprises me that so few lawyers are still doing it, especially now that after COVID, everybody was used to sitting in front of a computer screen and being on Zoom and, and things like that. And there are some great tools out there for lawyers to use to create video content where you don't need, and, and in a lot of cases, I hate to say it, but you really don't want a big video production with a slick package. And you know, I think I mentioned this morning, that might even scare some clients off who say, well, <laughs> I'm not gonna use that lawyer because they, they must be expensive because they've got to pay for this. <laughs> professional video production. Absolutely. And speaking of videos and legalese, I understand you do some videos online. Where can folks find your videos and find other ways to connect with you online? Sure. So my website is lawyermeltdown.com. And most of my videos, if not all of my videos, are posted there. I also have a Legal Ease Consulting YouTube channel. Awesome. Allison, always a pleasure to see you, to present with you. And thanks so much for being our guest here on Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. Thanks, Guy. Enjoy the rest of the tech show. You too. Thanks. Built for lawyers, Noda's cloud-based business banking is perfect for your solo or small law firm. You want to spend your day helping clients, not struggling to reconcile bank statements. Noda's customer service specialists are here to help you. They only support attorneys, so they understand the tools you use and the requirements you're up against and take your business as seriously as you do. Don't miss out on exciting new member benefits, including our partnership with Lawline to earn ethics credits for your CLEs. Online at trustnoda.com slash legal. Noda, banking built for law firms like yours. Terms and conditions may apply. of lawyers say they are overworked. And part of the problem is tedious tasks, like manually retyping information when drafting. LawYaw's document automation enables law firms to fill sets of word-based documents in court forms, cutting legal drafting time by 80%. Use intuitive features like conditional logic and e-sign to simplify drafting and improve client experience. Learn more at lawyaw.com. That's L-A-W-Y-A-W dot com. All right. Now, I'm super excited to introduce you to our next friend, not guest, Rookie Aww. Tajani. Rookie and I met last year at Tech Show. Yes. And this year, we did a segment on messaging, branding, and positioning. It was so fun. And I want to get into some of the meats of what we talked about, because yeah. I think, you know, there have been a few lawyers here, Guy, who have been highlighted having a very different approach to business and approach to the legal profession. Erin Levine, who did the keynote, um, mm-hmm. was a member on that keynote panel, was fantastic. She's a great example. Amazing. But Ruki, you've also taken a very different approach to your firm and positioning and messaging around your firm. I want to start out with the, like, why? Why did you decide to, to kind of take a counter approach to what we traditionally think of as the legal messaging? Yeah, I think it was out of sustainability and necessity for me as a attorney in general. Okay. So I've noted in many uh, instances when I've presented that I wanted to quit being a lawyer after a few years. And it wasn't because the practice of law in and of itself was inherently um, problematic. It was really because the administration of law, the execution of services, the delivery of, of services were somewhat problematic to me. And it wasn't something that I necessarily aligned myself with authentically. And I think as the more I had this conversation, the more I saw that diverse amounts of attorneys, you know, from all backgrounds really had issues or took issues with the way the legal services were administered. So when I started Firm for the Culture, it was really with an intent to have a business that happen to provide legal services and not have a law firm. And that was the approach that I took. And it was informed by a lot of my frustrations as well as my potential clients' frustrations with the way legal services were administered. So that's what I wanted to get into. What you just described, it's, Guy and I know this because of the clear legal trends reports. When yeah. you look at what lawyers think are important and what consumers of legal services think are important, there's a massive mismatch. And yeah. I feel like most lawyers don't see that. They don't get it. Yeah. Right? Why did you get it? Like, how did you get that insight? I think it's because the law never really got me. Okay. (laughs) 
frankly, uh, you know, it, it, I think as a first generation, everything, going to places like Berkeley and my federal clerkship and all these fancy places and never really feeling like I belonged, I think I would oftentimes find community with individuals and diverse folks that didn't necessarily see themselves as belonging in the legal space as well. Like whether it was the really, really colorful attorney <laughs> who didn't necessarily just wear black and white suits to the court or the really awesome paralegal who, you know, went to night school, for right. instance. There was a real rebellion against the typical archetype of what a lawyer should look like. So I think that a lot of what informed how I decided to run firm for the culture was not only informed by um, like my market research. Like I actually did market research. I asked people what they hated about the law. Okay, yeah, let's get into it. So who, yeah. did, who did you talk to? What did you ask? What did you find out? Yeah, so I before I started firm for the culture, I was a part of a bunch of different marketing um, Facebook groups. And I would just simply ask, what do you hate about lawyers? What don't you like about lawyers? And the comments <laughs> that yeah. rolled in. You have to have really thick skin as an attorney. Wait, people don't like lawyers? Oh my gosh, <laughs> they love us. Except in the instances of like 15 when million. When they have to talk to you, Right, lawyers. when you have to talk. They said that lawyers were esoteric. They said that lawyers were intimidating. They said that lawyers never apologized. They said that lawyers overcharged them. It was just all of these things. And it was really good to start firm for the culture with all of that insight. So in light of that, I started responding to that by building out services and automations that did the opposite. If there was something that I didn't know, I didn't necessarily act like I knew it. I said, listen, I don't really know this. Give me a week to either research it or refer you to someone. And it built a level of trust and it extended the lifetime value of the clients who ultimately came to me mm -hmm. because they knew that I was understanding them from a place that was informed by much of my market research. Yeah, and one of the things that in the session was striking me, it takes a certain amount, like we talk about authenticity yeah. all the time. We talk about like, yeah. be who you are. Yeah. And like you do that so well. And I, I, I always, when I was sitting there thinking about it, I was like, how much of this is just like who you are in terms of like knowing yourself and being that? Yeah. Because I know, you know, people are listening right now and they're like, like, I get it. I understand this authenticity stuff. Like, yeah, I understand yeah, yeah. that's what people want to relate to. Like, how do you tap you, into that so consistently? How do you tap into it? No, absolutely. So one of the things that you and I were talking about, Guy, right before uh, we started recording was our morning routines. Like, mm -hmm. how we get up, when we get up. And my morning routine is really, really essential to helping me constantly tap into myself. I get up at a ridiculously early time. And I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. But it is it's a just very, early. It's early. It is a very early time. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I get extensive, you know, time to just really focus on myself, focus on, you know, my, my goals, focus on who I am as a person, focus on my faith, because mm -hmm. that's a really important part of like my identity and go into spaces that I am navigating maybe three, four, five hours after I wake up with a very clear head and a very clear purpose as to how I'm going to approach the day. So one of the things that I do before I write any LinkedIn post is just simply journal. And I think the act of journaling, the act of reflecting, the act of, and I have really easy journal prompts. Like, what are you proud of? What are you grateful for? What's one thing that you're avoiding? What's one thing that you want to give yourself grace for? And then I'm a millionaire. Because that's, you know, we got to keep it yeah, cheap. Yeah, right. We got to keep, <laughs> <it, laughs> keep it financial. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very simple. I answer those questions in literally five minutes or less. And those simple prompts really clear my head to say, okay, what am I going to write about today? What am I going to write for today? And so I think it's the, it's the constant exercise of reminding yourself to tap back in. And it doesn't have to be long. I think a lot of people are scared of journaling because they think they have to write a soliloquy or they have to write a thesis. It's a very simple, what am I grateful for? What am I proud of? What's one thing I'm avoiding? What's one thing I get to do today? Right. And I'm a millionaire. <laughs> well, I think it's so important for people to hear that because, you know, and we talk about this all the time. We're like, we know it, right? We know it as human beings. We're like, we relate to people who are real. I mean, you can sense it anytime. I mean, but for a lot of people, it's scary. Yeah. But, but I think the other thing too that you, that's so uh, valuable there is it requires some discipline. Like you have to yeah. be mindful about it because it's so easy just to revert back and, and not be intentional about what you're doing. And that, that and then you don't have consistency. And then uh, now we have all the, the, now all of a sudden we go from that to we've got American Eagles on our websites and we're doing like, <laughs> right? all the lawyer stuff. No, right? exactly. And it's a, it, and, and I think the, the fact is, 
it's because we have so much going on in our lives. Right. It's like I, you know, we we talk about analytics and metrics and KPIs. Sometimes a lot of us as attorneys are experiencing data overload. Right. Oh yeah. And we the don't wrong know. Metrics. Would you like lots of data? <laughs> exactly. And we don't know what data to focus on. We don't know what things to focus on. We don't know what KPI to really push the needle towards when we're doing simple things like posting on Facebook or posting on Instagram or LinkedIn yeah. or even TikTok. Like you have all these random lawyers dancing and they don't even know why they're dancing. So exactly <laughs> on right. TikTok. Exactly. So one of the things that I really worked with myself to do and worked with coaches and 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 a lot of great friends was to make the tap in process as pragmatic and as easy as possible. Like literally every day it takes me three minutes and I just write out those questions and I just, you know, just write it out. And it just makes me feel so accomplished because I just got it done. And it, and it makes me feel a little bit more clear and level-headed. One of the things, one of my favorite books, and I'll just say this really quickly, is Atomic Habits. Oh, you yeah. know, Love by, James, uh, by James Clear. Oh, right? One of the best. And one of the things that he says is if we can get 1% better every single day, yeah. Our goals, our purposes, the things that we are set to achieve will just expand and increase monumentally. But he also talks about how, you know, the steps to that monumental progress are literally one at a time. So if you want to be the person that gets up in journals, you don't suddenly become that. Right. You do it by one day getting up in journaling, Tuesdays getting up in journaling, Wednesday getting up in journaling, and then you eventually become a person that gets up and consistently taps in with themselves through journaling. Right. Like you identify as a person who journals. Exactly. Right. Like yeah. I'm really working to identify as a person that exercises, but you know, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll get there. We'll get one there. Day but you're time. exercising one your day brain, at a time. Right? I, I, I'm I at mean, the, sure. at the risk of trying to <laughs> tie bagels. this directly oh, with, so bagels. <laughs> with bagels, with bagels, with lots okay, of bagels. Fair enough. Do you believe, and I think you have a very different branding and messaging and positioning from 99% of the law firms out there. Mm. I'm, which is like the whole point of the branding whole, <laughs> and messaging. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Which, but, but like, and 99% of them don't. don't. There's right. no standing out. Do you think your kind of self-reflection on the regular, because everyone is more than a JD. There's there's yeah. someone behind everything. Absolutely. Do you think that that process of reflecting on the day and what you're grateful for, et cetera, is that helping to distinguish and, and direct the brand? Absolutely. I do think that. I think that because I'm consistently seeking insight from inward instead of outward, it allows me to focus on how I can not only make the brand sustainable, but make the brand reach more people. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not necessarily looking, I'm not having as much shiny object syndrome. Mm -hmm. And because I'm looking internally and because I want to avoid data overload, I'm not even looking at certain, you know, people's LinkedIn accounts. I'm not looking mm -hmm. at certain people's profiles because again, that when I think of that in terms of metrics and data, that's a lot more data that may not necessarily drive me towards my bottom line, drive me towards having a sustainable law firm, drive me towards the particular clients that I have in mind. So I think a lot of what, and I think Guy pointed it out so greatly a couple of seconds ago, it takes a lot of discipline. Yeah. Because I am not immune to the to the doom scrolling. Mm -hmm. I am not immune to, you know, constantly seeing myself on LinkedIn and or Facebook and thinking 20 minutes later, what the heck was I doing? Right. But I do think that there is, um, just going back to my morning ritual and morning routine, there is something beneficial in understanding that that is what I'm doing and saying, okay, let's step back in. Right. Or let's get back to center. Right. All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, more from Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. If you're like a lot of lawyers that we talk to, you're trying to grow your firm, but you're having trouble doing more in a day than just managing your systems. So what you really need is a simple system that can easily identify where your profitable leads are coming from, analyze practice performance, and easily sync up matters. Now I've got to admit, I'm both an investor and advisor to Lawmatics. And the reason is I'm super excited what Matt's building over there. So you don't have to change your entire system. Lawmatics easily integrates with my case, Clio, Smokeball, Rocket Matter, and lots of others. So take a test drive today with Lawmatics to make client intake easier. Lawmatics.com. Join us on the road from Legal Talk Network for special conference coverage at ABA Tech Show 2023. I'm your host, Lawrence Coletti, recording live from Tech Show's Expo Hall floor, where we'll be talking about the future of the legal industry with keynote speakers like Cleo's Jack Newton, tech innovator Jazz Hampton, legal tech disruptor Aaron Levine, and of course, our good friend Kimberly Bennett. 
Our pre-show talk with Tech Show's co-chair Guy Sakilakis is already live, and every day during the conference, we'll be releasing new episodes with insider details you'll want to hear more about. So just go to LegalTalkNetwork.com and search Tech Show 2023 to hear all the episodes or listen to On the Road with your favorite podcasting app. We'll see you out there on the road at ABA Tech Show 2023. And we're back. We're back. I think another thing that would be uh, really valuable for people to hear about, because we talk about it can be scary. Let's get a little bit into like the tactics of it. So like, what's a day look like for you in terms of how you're promoting the brand? I mean, you know, people don't have time. I and mean, we talked about that too. Like you got to make this a priority. Absolutely. Um, so tell us a little bit, so if, you're, if you can share a little oh, bit about I'm your happy process. To. Yeah. I'm happy to. So I will say in the beginning, I didn't really have a process. I think as is the case of most people, I didn't really know what to say. I didn't really know what to do. But I do think that And again, going back to James Clear, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your system. So really having a solid system that works for you, even if it doesn't look like something that everyone else would use. And for me, frankly, I just use my notes app Mm -hmm. in my iPhone. I remember looking at a YouTube that says, use your notes app as your second brain. Okay. I didn't want something that I had to, I didn't want yet another SaaS platform that I had to pay for. I didn't want, (laughs) right? I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't want these things. I wanted something simple and something that I, that was accessible to me very, very quickly and something that I could use every single day. So I started really digging into my notes app on my iPhone, making folders, organizing my hashtag, and then starting to bring links. Like I have, I have a, iPhone note section called swipe file. Mm -hmm. So if I see really good stuff, I literally grab the link and I put it in my note section. I also do Google alerts Mm -hmm. and I filter my Google alerts. Let me just say that because I don't want to look at it every single time it comes in. So I have it go to a certain folder in my Gmail. And then every time I'm in need of content, I just look at my Google alerts and I say, okay, what's happening in the trademark world there? What is something that I can write about? And then, so that, and along with my swipe file in my notes folder, it makes writing something very, very simple and, or at least a lot easier Mm -hmm. than it would typically be if I were writing from a clean slate every single time. No, I love that. And then, so you've got the, the ideas, you've got some research, you've got some content. Do you set aside like a dedicated time where you're publishing and recording? Uh, Is that like a daily process, weekly? Are you batching? Talk to us about that. It's something that I definitely want to do a little bit more. And it's something that if I'm being honest, I should have more discipline around. So it's interesting because one of the struggles that I have is because I, I think because I write off the cuff so much, working with independent contractors or working with other marketing agencies, it's really hard to find someone who can write as authentically or write in a way that I write. So it's a constant exercise of not only writing, but also documenting the things that were really popular, putting it into either a SaaS platform or back in my notes app, and then showing other parties, showing other people, okay, this is what's been successful in the past. Replicate this, write something similar like this. So it is something that I want to dedicate myself to building out more extensively so we can be as consistent without worrying what's going to come up the next day. Cool. And then one other thing I think people be curious about, like, are you doing everything yourself or do you have support do you have people like yeah. editing and production people because i mean you're the stuff you put out it's like it looks like super professional so talk to us about the uh, thank that, you, you know. i use a lot of tools that we use every single day like for instance loom believe it or not has really good editing capabilities mm-hmm. like it's not you can upload videos that are not native to the app and you can literally just cut the videos in whatever way you want. And I use Canva. So I may have team members do it from time to time, but because I'm still going off the cuff of sorts, I may just say, oh, this clip looks really good. Like the one that Conrad and I had that like went semi-viral. It was just a really good clip that I uploaded to uh, Loom, I cut, and then I went to Canva, added some things, and then posted it. And I posted the, what does it say? I said, he said, I don't look like an attorney. That's and like right. people were just like, what is this? <laughs> like, and it got so I know. many views, but it was very much like, what's something that would resonate with me, right? right? And going back to our original conversation around what consumers think versus what lawyers think, what do you think as a person who just happens to have a JD? Right. right. What do you want to see? What are the things that you double tap on? We're not double tapping on everybody in suits with the gavel on their website. Right. right. Like we're doing more than that because we are more complex than that. We're more diverse than that. You've done a great job. I mean, your firm has grown. The messaging, marketing, yeah. positioning has really resonated. 
as an individual, it's fairly easy to keep a brand extremely consistent because it is you. As the business grows, that becomes much more complex. What do you do to kind of police or maintain or, or have some level of consistency as your brand and your business gets bigger? It's something that I'm honestly still trying to figure out right now. One of the things that I am doing with my team is, again, KPIs or metrics on more organic marketing. So for instance, we have LinkedIn Lives that we do pretty consistently. Now I support my team in, in having them make content with the LinkedIn Live. And then we discuss the goals, we discuss the metrics, we discuss the analytics attached to that. We are getting ourselves into a um, kind of groove of sorts where we are consistently making intentional content together together. Okay. So we so I may put something on LinkedIn and I'll say, okay, why don't you share something similar on your page or okay. why don't you share something similar on another platform? So through muscle exercise yeah. and through muscle memory and recall and feedback, we're starting to find our individual voices. But I think that process also gives space to other people's contributions because they may do something entirely different. Yeah. Then I may say, oh, that's actually really cool. Let's do some, let's do more of that. Right. Right? So that's how I'm doing it. It's it's laborious. It's 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 long. And I don't know if it's frankly sustainable the bigger our team gets, but I think working with the team that we have right now and just having some intentional conversations about what goes out on the firm for the culture platforms is something that works for us right now. Okay. So you mentioned uh, getting into a groove. Not to totally change subjects, but what's this Groove app all about? Oh my gosh, I'm actually having a LinkedIn Live over it. So there you Groove, go. So Groove is this um, app on your phone, on Android or iOS, that essentially allows you to co-work with anyone across the world. Wow. In 50-minute Pomodoro sections or 50-minute Pomodoro blocks. So to show you how addictive I am to Groove, I've started Groove in September, and again, one groove is 50 minutes. I've done 1,100 of them. Wow. So when you ask me like about my morning rituals, about staying consistent, the beautiful thing about groove is that you, you know, start a groove button and then it puts this signal out to the groove reverse of like thousands of folks to say, hey, Guy started a groove. Do you want to join his groove? So you pop into groove and then kind of like a Zoom style video, you start off by talking about some of the things that you're going to do for the next 50 minutes. So typically I may do, okay, I'm going to do my journaling. I'm going to set my intentions for the day. That's always my first groove of the day. And then I may have somebody from France who I oftentimes groove with, my, my dear friend Jessica, and she'll say, okay, I'm going to work right now. I'm going to read this book. And then I may have someone from India. I actually have a friend named Saru from India who grooves with me pretty regularly. And he says, I'm going to listen to this podcast and reflect on it. So there's no required thing that you have to do. The only thing is you get to be productive with this light accountability. So after five minutes of pre-group, the screen closes, we don't see anyone, and then another screen pops up with an opportunity to write down what we're gonna do. And as we cross those things off, there's a chat feature in the Groove app that like says, Gee finished X, Y, Z, or Conrad finished A, B, C, or Rookie finished. So if there's a motivation because you see other people finishing their stuff. So it's, so it's very much like I have to finish my stuff too. And I'm actually having a LinkedIn Live as a as the time of the recording. I'm having a LinkedIn Live with one of the Groove founders on March 9th where we talk about tech and trademark. So I'm awesome. really excited because it's been... I think it's really powerful for the solopreneur who wants to find community yet still be productive. Like oh. it's been, it's been a game changer that's in my so, life. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's a, that's kind of the third kind of point on all this stuff. But like, it can be lonely out there, right? Yeah. It was it lonely is. as a business <laughs> owner. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. That's so cool. Groove. And it's really great for lead generation. Oh. Oh, I've gotten clients. Oh, oh bingo. I've gotten cool. clients. Because when you say but, what you're... You, but you're, you're not doing you. it to get the clients. No, I'm not doing that's it to right, get right, the clients. That's right. That's the whole point, I'm not right? doing it to get the clients. So if, you know, out of 1,100 grooves, you, you, you tend to say things that are related to what you do as a... <laughs> As right, a, right. It, to what you do. So I'll say, okay, I'm going to work on clearing your trademark. And people will just be like, especially if they're other small business owners, right. oh, you do trademarks or you do marketing or you do this or do that. And I'm like, yeah, why don't we connect on LinkedIn? Yeah. Right. And we go from there. But I've, I've gotten clients from Groove. Brand I've gotten, affinity. Absolutely. We, uh, Guy and I often talk about not just brand awareness, but brand affinity. And that's mm. what you're building with something like that. Yeah, brand loyalty. Exactly. Absolutely. Very cool. Let me ask a different question. You clearly have a different approach to thinking about the law and the delivery of services of the law. 
we're seeing kind of at a macro level changes in the way the law is delivered. Arizona is an example of that. Yeah. There's lots of changes in how legal services are being delivered. Do you feel like the legal populace, lawyers coming out of school, are you an anomaly or is the body of people t becoming lawyers, is that also changing? I don't know if I'm an anomaly because I don't have the statistics to back it up. But what I will say is that a lot of law schools have been inviting me more and more to speak ah, to their students. That's great. So in the last few months, I've been invited to Berkeley, I've been invited to Stanford, and I've been invited to other law schools in the country to talk to their students about entrepreneurship and the legal space. I do think that there is a reckoning in the legal field that's kind of going on, where even if the powers that be that you know dictate the status quo are not necessarily seeing a problem, I think a lot of younger attorneys are really seeing that this is just not the way that it has to be. Right. And I think because of lawyers like me and lawyers like my amazing colleagues like Decora Davis and other really popular lawyers who utilize social media to get their point across, not only are our ideal clients seeing that, other lawyers are seeing that. Right. Other attorneys are seeing that. Law school students are seeing that. So I can't say it, that, you know, I'm an anomaly or something that's becoming more common. But what I can say is that I'm getting invited to more schools by the powers that be at these legal right. institutions, right? I'm also getting a lot of DMs from lawyers and law students alike. And I'm getting asked about how do you do this thing in the way that you do it. So that's anecdotal okay. evidence. <laughs> you know, I think, and that's the thing, I think people see it and they're just like, yes, like it just clicks when yeah. they see what you're doing. They're like, oh yeah, that, you know, <laughs> right. this is the way we should be doing it this. It makes sense to them. Right, it makes sense, right? You're just like, it's hard to articulate it, but when you see it and you experience it, you're like, oh yeah, that's what we should be doing, right? Yeah. Um, All right, so Ruki, I'm a lawyer. I'm uninspired, I'm sitting in my office, and I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking, what's my first step in making my law firm different? From a messaging and positioning, I've decided I'm gonna move away from trying to brand myself as an attorney to who I am. What's my first step? Well, shameless plug, follow me on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah 100%. <laughs> you, know. you know what, actually, that's, it's that's probably great. the best advice, right? Uh, Go find a bunch of, like, Byron Brown out of, I think he's in Nevada, you, like, there's lots of people doing this very differently, and there's a lot of inspiration that, to be had out there. I think that's a great point. Absolutely. Follow, you know, follow really great lawyers who you, who not even like you want to be like, because maybe you don't know what you don't know quite yet, yeah. but who simply inspire you, who, who make you double tap on their posts, right? Just really following them and, 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 and going on this meandering journey. But even outside the law, follow business owners that you like. Follow ah. business people that you resonate with. And really give yourself permission, like be uh, bold enough to say, maybe I can do the law like Marie Folio does business or Oprah does speaking right. or Gary V does the law. I don't know if I would want a lawyer. No, no, like no, 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 no. Gary V, frankly. I got to pull that off my but, bio. <laughs> but, but I'm saying this to say, as lawyers, I think that law school does an amazing job in getting us to be terrified of taking risk. Yeah. And... You know, the saying think like a lawyer is not simply in terms of analytics, but it's also in terms of just having this really narrow focus on what the law actually does instead of the impact that the law can make across different sectors, across different industries and across different populations. So I think that one of the things that we can do to significantly benefit the law in the long run is look outside the law to find those solutions and to find ways that people are approaching issues that come up time and time again. Awesome. All right. Thank you for joining us. It was great to see you in person. It was great again, to see you. Again, we only ever meet up in Chicago, even though we're both on the West Coast. I know. We got to figure that out. We'll, we'll work on it. Okay. We'll bring you together as well. That works. Thank you for listening to Lunch Hour Legal Marketing. If you'd like more information about what you heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Follow Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. 
And I'm sweating because I f***ed that up. No, it's fine. That's, what, that's, <laughs> that's why we have our pros here, to help us look good. That's right. That's going straight to YouTube. <laughs> straight. <laughs> Oh, this one's actually streaming live. I forgot to tell you guys. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. As a lawyer, keeping up with developments in information security, cyber threats, and e-discovery is a never-ending process. Fortunately, the Digital Detectives podcast does the hard work for you. I'm Sharon Nelson, and together with John Simic, we bring on industry experts to discuss the latest tech developments that help keep your data secure only on the Digital Detectives Podcast.